Good morning. Happy Sunday. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us, whether you're here in person or online. We're so glad you're here. If it's your first time, don't forget to fill out one of our connection cards. They're found in the pew back in front of you or online. That's just so we can stay connected with you and get you plugged in in all the ministries that you're interested in. Or if you just want to give us some updated contact information, don't forget to fill out one of those again. And we also have prayer cards always available in the pew back in front of you or online. That's for you, a friend, a family member, anyone, anytime. Don't forget to fill out one of those prayer request cards. We pray over you guys every single week as a staff. Just a few announcements before we get started. And the first is that Ash Wednesday is literally this week coming up Wednesday, the 22nd. We're going to have a potluck at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. So you can bring a dish to pass. You can help set up with that. And then we're also going to have a worship service in the fellowship hall around 645. So it's going to be a great time. And you can also help tear down after the event. So we'd love to see you guys there. And you can sign up at the opportunities desk. I just want to remind all of our high school and middle school friends that we have Stoke Youth Group tonight from 7 till 830. Should be a great time. Hope to see you there. Hope you bring your friends. Uh, Again, can't wait to see you there. And for all of our pre-K through fifth grade friends, Spark Kids Club is meeting again this week from 6 to 7.30. We've been having a great time here. Again, invite your friends. The more the merrier. Um, but this is a great time. We've loved getting to spend time with you and learning about Jesus with you. Wednesday is going to be such a busy but great day. We also have Whitcomb service at 10 a.m. Don't forget to come there to enjoy another great Ash Wednesday service. We hope to see you guys all there. Those have been great. It's a great opportunity to just worship with some other people in our community. We offer several different spiritual retreats here throughout the year, and two of them are coming up uh, pretty quick. Man Camp is March 17th through the 19th, and Women's Retreat is April 14th through the 16th. These are both amazing getaways where you can uh, kind of escape normal life, do some fun activities with members of the church family, and really grow and deepen your spiritual walk. If you would like to attend either of those, Connie Lesh has more information on Women's Retreat, Mark Acker has more information on Man Camp, or you can go to MiracleCamp.com and sign up there or get more information. Again, these are great opportunities. We hope you take advantage of them. Evangelism is taking a group to see the movie Jesus Revolution Saturday, March 4th. We rented out a 50-person theater at Celebration Cinema. It's going to be such a great time. We're also planning on going to get dinner afterwards. If you would like to come see this movie, if you'd like to come get dinner with us, it is $10 a person for a ticket, or you can also add on like a little popcorn snack thing for like $6.50. There is some more information and a sign-up sheet at the Opportunities Desk. It's first come, first serve, so definitely sign up for this. It's going to be an awesome movie and an awesome time to just take some people out and get together. We can't wait to see you guys there. And lastly, speaking of the opportunities, yes, we just want to remind you, if you have something that you would like a sign-up for, please let Bev in the church office know so she can make up a sign-up sheet for you. Let her know how long you want that up for, and she will get you the information from that. Uh, this way we can just kind of help keep an eye on what's going up there, and we can know uh, what we're having people sign up for at any, any given time. I think that's enough announcements. Let's continue to worship together. Good morning. Yes, thank you, Will. That is enough announcements. But thank you. It's a great morning. It's, I'm sorry for my constant weather fixation, but it is a beautiful morning. And it is great to be out, and it's great to be here in worship. Let's stand and sing together. All of the earth make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shed of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom will be a church 
ready for you every heart longing for our king we sing even so come lord jesus come anticipation, not of the nine o'clock meeting we have, not of our lunch. For me, it's lunch or whenever it is dinner or whatever that's for supper. That's not what we should be waiting for. That's not what our anticipation is. That's not what our longing is each day. But Jesus, we're ready for you. We're ready and we're waiting. We won't be caught unaware. We're ready. Let's continue to sing. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there are wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands. That your goodness is good without end, and you'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday.
Gracious Father, we come to you and with worshipful hearts. We come to you ready to praise your name and to, to be part of your, your family and to be your children. And sometimes as we come, we have heavy hearts and we think, these are the worst days ever. There have never been days like this in our history. We have death, turmoil, strife, sickness, you name it. But we know that that's the way it has been. That's the way it has been as sin has entered into our world long ago. But you have been faithful. You have been steadfast. You have kept your promise and continue to be that one rock, solid foundation that you have been since the beginning of time. And as we think about the things that we count, the things that we count against our lives, the things that we are disappointed in, the things that we are worried about. Help us to remember your steadfast strength, your healing power. The one and only God is here, has come down to us, and is a part of our world, and we're thankful for that. As we think about this time of worship, help us to take a breath. Help us to close our eyes gather our thoughts, and pay attention to what you're telling us this morning. It's through your son we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. <laughs> um, I'm going to dismiss the kids to Children's Church. You can go with Mr. Will. Have fun. Good luck with him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I meant it. I meant it like that. Um, my name is Savannah. I'm the director of congregational care here, if you didn't know. I'm also the one in the announcements that definitely messed up the time for the Whitcomb service. The Whitcomb service this Wednesday is 10.30, not at 10. I don't know what possessed me to say that. But it's at 10.30, just so you all know. Um, so we hope to see you guys there. And for almost this entire year, for January and February, we have been studying a book called Ruthless Elimination of Hurry written by John Mark Comer. It's a great book. If you haven't been here, um, highly recommend the book. It's amazing, and if you have been here, I think we can all agree that there's such great things that you can take away from this book. It opens a lot about yourself and about God, so it's been really great. And these past few weeks specifically, we've been talking about the solution to this problem that we have of hurry, this problem that 
is eating away at us in all forms, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, it just gives us a constant undercurrent of anxiety, pushing us to the next thing, the next trend, the next, next task on our to-do li to list. And so last week we covered three parts of the solution in this book to hurry, and those were silence, solitude, and Sabbath. And then we're going to finish our series today, and I'm kind of sad we're finishing it, but we're going to go over the last two parts of our solution. So today we're talking about simplicity and slowing. And as we go throughout these today, I want you to remember that these are what we call spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices. These are what the capital C Christian church has deemed essential and necessary for your relationship with Christ. These are things that we're called and commanded to do as Christ followers. So first we're gonna focus on the solution of simplicity. We're called to live simple lives as Christ followers and part of the reason is to keep us away from this problem, this soul-sucking problem of hurry. So John Mark Comer starts this section of his book by pointing out that we're actually way more uncomfortable with simplicity than we think. Um, we like the saying, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. We like the saying, blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Um, we like the Jesus that heals, that tells us that we're going to be forgiven in all of these things. But we don't like hearing, blessed are those who are poor. We don't like the Jesus that tells the Roman centurion to sell all of his, all of his things if he wants to make it to heaven. We don't like hearing that it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. We don't like to think about those phrases because they're harsh. Surely God can't mean that, right? Surely Jesus can't mean that it's hard for me to get to heaven just because I have some wealth, right? Because we have bills to pay. We have retirement to save for. We have Christmas gifts to buy. We have Starbucks to get. We have all of these things to get, faster phones, these materialistic things that consume our everyday lives. Because more money means more things, which means more comfortability and more happiness. Like, money m literally makes the world go round, right? We can't imagine not being able to get what we want when we want it. We can't imagine a world without Amazon. At least I can't. We cannot imagine a world without newer smartphones or without our watches, without cars, without TVs, without subscriptions. Everyone has those things, everyone. That's just part of the world today. But it's not a simple life. Listen to the words of Jesus, of Jesus in Luke 12. This is part of his Sermon on the Mount. Do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life consists for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Our lives are, be to, are to be full of simplicity. We're not supposed to worry about the latest fashion trend or the new watch or the new iPhone or the new sushi place or getting the pizza of the month at Silver Beach Pizza. We're not supposed to be worrying about those things because life is more than these, right? Jesus goes on to say that God takes care of the birds and the flowers, and how much more are we worth to God than those things? We are worth everything to him. He says he's gonna take care of us and give us, if we, give us what we actually need if we would just stop seeking the next thing in this world and just seek him. John Mark Comer, our author, men mentions a French sociologist that states, atheism hasn't replaced cultural Christianity, shopping has. Shopping has become the number one leisure activity in America today. We fill our things with new, we fill our lives with new organization bins, with movies, clothes, shoes, iPads, cars, mugs, anything that we can get our hands on. And John Mark Comer writes, there's a reason the only other God Jesus ever called out was the God of money, because it's a bad God and a lousy religion. Now we are what we buy. That's what makes us who we are. We are defined um, by what we buy, not by what or who we believe in in our society. I'm an iPhone user, not an Android user. I'm a Starbucks drinker, not a Dunkin' drinker. Things like that. These are 
how society sees me. This is what makes me who I am. But have you ever noticed that that stuff that we get, that we're told that we need to have just to live, just to be in society, just to be happy, never actually does any of those things in the long run? It never actually makes us happy. Sure, I was happy when I got my new car. Like, I love my new Jeep. It's great. But I have not been satisfied in my soul from it. I love my new shoes. I'm wearing a room. I love my shoes, love them, but they don't like make me feel at rest in my spirit. These things don't work, so I guess I need to get the next thing and the next thing. If I just had that new car, if I just had that new laptop, if I just had this, then maybe I would be set and good. But then we keep going over and over until our lives are filled to the brim and there's no room for anything else. There was a study conducted out of Princeton University where two doctors did this study, and they found that your overall well-being rises with your income, but only up to a certain point, and that point is $75,000, which when you think about it, really is not that much. Like, you would think, like, millionaires or something like that. But one of the doctors that conducted the study wrote, no matter who you are or where you live, your emotional well-being is as good as it's going to get at $75,000, and money is not going to make it better beyond that point. It's like you hit some sort of ceiling, and you just can't get emotional well-being much higher by having more money, because the God of money is a bad God and a lousy religion. None of these things are actually doing what we're constantly told they're going to be doing. And that's exactly what God has told us and warned us about over and over again. That life comes through him, not anything else. How nice does just simplicity sound, just the word simplicity? To me, it sounds like a break. It sounds like rest. It sounds like peace, because it is. Remember, Jesus said life does not con consist in abundance of possessions. When we're not living a simple life, when we're not relying on God to provide for us, when we believe we can find happiness in the next thing, we are not believing in the gospel message. We are believing in a prosperity gospel, the gospel of America, that more money will make me more happy. And until we start living minimalistically, we will not understand that Jesus is right. There is a better way to live. More stuff does not equal more happiness. It means more stress. It means more anxiety. It means more worry. It means more hurry to get the next thing. And again, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasure in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not steal and break in. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. If you're storing up things here, if you have treasure here, and that's what you're concerned about, that's where your heart is. And your heart cannot be in two places. If you're feeling the anxiety and rush of culture to get the new thing and you're literally buying into it, trying to make yourself happy with more things, your heart will not find peace, it will not find rest because your heart is not with God. God does not exist in these things. Like the Israelites had to rely on God for manna in the wilderness in Exodus, we are supposed to rely on him for life. How many mugs or water bottles do you actually need? And I wrote that question for myself. Yeah. How many pair of shoes do you need? How many games do you need? And is the clutter in your home actually making your life more simple and more peaceful? Because I guarantee the answer is no. I want to encourage you guys today, as you go throughout your week, as you go throughout this year, as you go throughout the next year, limit your consumption. Just be aware of what you're buying. Go home and go through your stuff. Go through your shoes. Go through your games, your mugs, whatever it is that you just can't get enough of. For me, it's cups, like I said. I don't know why, but I just like cannot stop buying cups. And the first time I read this book, 
the author literally says something like, yes, I'm talking to you mug collectors. And I shut that book and I went and, and I went through all my mugs because I was like, no, this will not call me out right now. And <laughs> I have so many mugs, guys. Like I got rid of so many and I still have so many for literally no reason. And it made me show that, it showed me that like, it honestly gave me more anxiety than anything else. Even though I loved those mugs, like they were giving me anxiety because I don't have any room for them. And then they would just sit in boxes and then they would just clutter up space and it was just too much. Like these things that we think are giving us happiness are giving us anxiety. They take up too much room. And I'm not telling you to go home and literally get rid of everything and quit your job and live off the land and just rely on God um, for food. Because I, that's not what I'm telling you. Please don't do that. But I'm, as, I'm asking you to just actually believe that God is all you need. And that you will not find a simple, Jesus-filled life when your life is already full to the brim with everything else. The last solution to our problem of hurry is slowing. And that sounds pretty obvious, right? Like the opposite of being in a rush or being in a hurry would be to slow down, to go slow. We're living at a pace right now that does not let us slow down. It is constant, it's ever increasing, it's life taking. We've talked about this already through the entire series. I don't need to convince you and remind you how fast we constantly are going and how bad it is. But I am here today to tell you that you have to slow down to experience Christ. The kingdom of God is not in a hurry. So if you are, you've already missed it. Jesus was not in a hurry to move on to the next person to heal. Right? Dan brought this story up. Like Jesus was on his way to go heal someone when the woman touched the fringe of his cloak and he stopped. And that person that he was going to heal was dying. And he stopped and paid attention to that woman. Jesus was not in a hurry. The spirit is not in a hurry to move through you, get a little task done, and move on. God is not in a hurry. That's not how he works. He's patient, and he's kind, and he's slow to anger, and he waits. He sits and waits because he has perfect timing. And last week, Dan spoke of silence and solitude. So that's this idea of slowing our minds slowing our thoughts down enough to just sit in the Lord's presence in silence and listen to him for once. But today, the slowing that we're talking about is our physical slowing, the slowing of our body. We have to do both. Because how can you slow your thoughts in your mind while you're running around doing things around the house, while you're out shopping, while you're doing more work, doing the next thing on your to-do list? The mind and the body go together. So if you can't slow your body, you're not going to slow your mind. And this goes with the hurry sickness symptom of restlessness that I talked about a while ago. I said, you cannot rest in the presence of God while being restless. It's the same thing. With this undercurrent of anxiety and constant thoughts and lists and tests, we, we just can't sit still. But if we can just manage to slow our bodies down enough to slow our thoughts, then we can finally see and taste that the Lord is good. That's when that happens. We can finally breathe again. We can experience his peace, his goodness, his love, his will. Physically slowing down, it's the obvious solution. So how do we do it? Because we're not used to it, right? We're used to going 100 miles an hour, doing the next thing, never slowing down. So John Mark Comer gives a list, and this is why these are called spiritual practices, because we have to continually practice these things, force ourselves to do them so that they become natural and spiritual for us. So he gives us a list of things you can do to help force yourself to slow down and, until it becomes more natural. So if, we're going to go through some of them. The first practice is drive the speed limit. That I'm already out right there. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I'm one of those people. But seriously, forcing yourself to just go the speed limit, will sh if you struggle with that, will really show you like how much anxiety you have with going slow. Um, the second one, get into the slow lane again. Mm, no. Third, actually come to a full stop at a stop sign. That's a hard one. <laughs> Notice a trend here, like we're always physically in a hurry to the point of like just following the law on the road is like blasphemy to us. We're like, absolutely not. I cannot do that. 
The fourth one, don't text and drive. This literally kills thousands of people a year because we can't slow down enough to just not look at the notification, to not respond. It's killing us. Number five, show up 10 minutes early for an appointment without your phone. What am I gonna do? Read, pray, do something. People existed before phones, just so you know. Um, Another thing, number six, this is a hard one. Get in the longest line, longest and slowest line at the grocery store. Oh, yep. <laughs> out. I'm out there. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's hard. Force yourself to wait. Why do we have so much anxiety with like being slow? Seventh, turn your smartphone into a dumb phone. So this is getting rid of social media apps, silencing your um, notifications, or he goes on to say you can combine this one. Get a flip phone if that works better for you. Number nine is parent your phone, meaning put your phone to bed so that you're not scrolling for hours into the night and wondering why you're tired the next day. Um, put on do not disturb so you can actually focus while you're doing something. And then I'm going to combine some of the other practices into this one. He says to put time limits on certain apps or put times for certain social media times and um, keep your phone off until you're done with a morning quiet time. That's a good one. You don't need to wake up and immediately be bombarded with everything going on. Like that cannot be good for your soul. Wake up and start your day with God and you will notice a difference. Another practice he lists is kill your TV or set times for streaming or watching TV. Netflix recently reported that the average user watches a whole TV series in five days. A whole series, like not just a season, a whole TV series in five days. That's hours a day, hours. Another practice is single task. Force yourself to just focus on one thing at a time, God forbid, right? When you're having a conversation with someone, just have the conversation, don't look at your phone. When you're playing games with people, play the game. Don't do anything else. When you're, out, when you're cleaning or shopping, don't listen to a book or do something else. Watch TV, just clean, or just go shopping. Let yourself slow down and do one thing. Last one I'm gonna mention, this one's so hard. <laughs> walk slower. For me, I don't know why, but I walk unnaturally fast for literally no reason. I just always feel like I have to be in a hurry. Um, and when people like walk slow, like as if they're going the speed limit, it irritates my soul. And I mentioned last, I mentioned last service that like John, my husband, walks so slow. <laughs> I, just, I literally can't. And he's probably walking at a normal pace, but like for me, it's like I can't. Like I will literally leave him behind at the grocery store. I do not have time for that. I don't care. He can find himself through Meyer or something like that. But I don't know why I feel like I have to go so fast. And there's literally no reason for it. And I wonder like why I have anxiety and he doesn't because he's going at a normal pace and he's fine. But these are just some of the practices that Comer writes to force yourself to slow down. The list can go on and on and it's different for everyone. But the fact that these practices, just these normal things make us squirm, show us that we have an issue. We're like addicted to being in a hurry. When in college my professor demonstrated this to me and it has stuck with me and changed how I view my relationship with Jesus. She said, imagine Jesus is sitting in a chair. We have two chairs here and they're facing each other. Jesus is sitting there and this is your chair. And Jesus is always sitting there ready to have time with us. And when we sit down, it's like when we're praying, when we're worshiping, when we're just spending time with him, reading the scripture, stuff like that, because it's a relationship. We're spending time with him. For most of us, though, like we'll pray throughout our day here and there. We might read a verse here and there. So it's like we're walking around the chair and never actually taking time to slow down. Like we'll come touch the chair and say like, hey, Jesus, thank you for waking me up. I really got to get going, though. Got to go to work. And then we leave. Or we'll say, hey, Jesus, I'm sorry. Like I really wanted to read scripture today, but I just, I just need to go sit down and watch Netflix. And then we'll leave. We never slow down enough to actually just sit in the chair and have a conversation and spend time with God. And that is not a relationship. If you, imagine you treated your friend or your parents or your spouse like that. You will not have those people in your life anymore. 
Because it's not a relationship. You're not sitting down with them to just spend time with them. You're too much in a hurry for them. You don't have enough time for them. Simplicity and slowing are both essential. They're both essential practices to help solve this problem of hurry, but also just be a Christ follower. We know that there's a problem with hurry in our society. We know that it's killing us. Like, we can't keep living like this with all this anxiety and all the things to do and giving in to everything. So it's time to do something. It's time for a solution. I'm one of those people where I, get, I can get really irritated when we sit and talk about what's wrong and how we all agree that we can't keep living like this and then we do nothing about it. So we've gone over, two weeks now, we've gone over solutions. There's silence, solitude, Sabbath, simplicity, and slowing. I want you to engrave those five S's in your head and engrave them in your daily, your weekly routine. We have to do something. We can't keep living like this. This is finally how we have peace again. This is how we have rest again. This is how we have God again, just God in our lives, by doing these things, these spiritual disciplines and practices. So as we move on and we continue throughout our worship today and as you go, I just really want you to work on this. I encourage you to do what you have to do, whatever it is. Everyone's different. Silence and solitude looks different for everyone. I had a professor that did hours of silence and solitude every morning. Not me. Mm -mm. I'm not about that. But I do need silence and solitude in some way, right? So figure out what works for you and actually do something about it. Find some rest for your soul. That's what God wants. So we're going to continue to worship. And as we go throughout this song together, this is when we take time to focus on our offering, and there are many different ways that you can give. And I talked about simplicity to get today, and if forcing yourself to just give something and rely on the Lord for your finances is how you have to practice simplicity, then do it. So there are many different ways you can give. We're going to give it this time, and I encourage you to sit and think about what we've been talking about for this entire year so far. So we're going to pray, and then we'll worship. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that it's Sunday and you are good and no matter what, you love us. And we just thank you for that. We thank you so much and we can't be thankful enough. Help us to live with silence, solitude, Sabbath, simplicity, and slowing. Help us to live those out so we can just finally have some rest and peace because we know only those things come from you. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we pray all of this in your good and holy name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. If you did not pick up any communion elements on the way in, then if you look to the center aisle, then... You will be served. You are my joy. You are my soul. defends me your love defends me and when I feel like I'm all alone your love defends me your love defends me day after 
day, night after night, I will remember you're with me in this fight. Although the battle, it rages on, the war is already won. I know the war is already won. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. defends me and when I feel like I'm all alone your love defends me your love defends me surely my God is the strength of my soul your love defends me your love defends me and when When Jesus invited his 12 disciples to gather right before he was going to be crucified, right before he was going to be betrayed. And that's what he does for us. The 12 disciples were a mess. <laughs> they were a mess. They were crazy. They probably didn't like each other at times. And yet he decided to slow down before the biggest thing that could possibly happen was going to happen. And he just wanted to break bread and be with his followers. And there was a chair for every single disciple. There was a chair for Judas right before he did what he was going to do. And there's a, table, there's a chair for you at the table. No matter what you've done, if you've been in a hurry, you haven't had enough time for him, you haven't been making time for him, whatever it is, there's a, there's a chair for you. So I invite you to peel back the first little part of your little snack pack. And I like to break the actual wafer because he broke the bread and he broke his body for us. It just reminds me that his body was literally beaten and broken to bits for me. And as you take and eat this, you are accepting that he broke his body for you. And you're accepting it, which means you're going to live in belief of that. And every single day, that's what it's about, about Christ, about what he gave for you. So let's take and eat. And I can peel back the second part. And this is also a reminder that his body was broken, but his blood was spilled completely to the point of death for you, no matter what you did. And so we're going to take and drink together 
and remember that Jesus loves you enough to die. So please take and drink. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you love us enough and that you find us worthy to die. And while you were up on the cross, you saw us at our lowest point, where we, the, we were the farthest we could be away from you, and you still wanted to be up there. But you also saw us at our best. You saw us close to you, and you found it worth it. And we just thank you for that. We thank you that you were willing to break your body in horrible ways. And you were, able to, you were willing to spill your blood for us. Help us to accept that that we are found worthy in your eyes and help us to live every day in belief of that. We live every day as followers of you, as examples of you because what you have done for us. We love you and we praise you and we pray all this in your good and holy name. Amen. Let's stand and sing a final song together. Our rock, the only solid ground The nations rise and fall Kingdom once strong, now shaken We trust forever in your name in the name of Jesus We trust the name of Jesus Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. I hope that you enjoy a great week. Don't hurry out. Again, we're going to slow down and go slowly, deliberately out towards the door. 
and say hello to every, everybody that's here, and we'll see you next time.